I'm in Joshua chapter number 2. Now Joshua is sending out two men to spy out Jericho. Back in Numbers 13, Israel sent out 12 to spy out the land. And only two gave a good report, which was Joshua and Caleb. And I wonder if Joshua just sends out two because he knows these two are going to give a good report when they get back. And in Luke 14, 28, the Lord speaks about counting the cost. And he goes on to say in Luke 12, 31, he says, What king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. So the Lord talks about counting the cost and Joshua knows that he's going to win. Joshua 1, 5, he knows nobody's going to be able to stand against him. But, you know, part of being a good soldier is seeing what you're up against, not being ignorant of the enemy. You know, not being ignorant of the devil's devices, Second Corinthians 2.11, and counting the cost. Have you counted the cost? There are some prices you'll pay, some consequences you're going to face when it comes to walking the Christian walk. And in Joshua chapter 2, you can see some good illustrations from the two spies and Rahab about some prices you'll pay when you're enlisted on the winning side of eternity, especially if you're a saint who lives for the Lord. Facing hard times for the Lord in this life will result in great rewards in the next life. And there's no price you'll pay for salvation, but there's a definite price you'll pay for serving. Have you counted the cost of what you will face to live godly in Christ Jesus? Are you willing to lay it all on the line? Anything worth doing will cost you something. Here are some of those things that go along with selling out to God. Are you leaning on the Lord enough to face the challenge? Have you counted the cost? Now, look at Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came two men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, whether the men went, I won't not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. So, here's one of the prices you'll pay to be in the Lord's army right here. You're going to have principalities trailing you. Number one, you're going to have principalities trailing you. You see, the king of Jericho found out that two spies were coming to search out the country. So he sends his men in pursuit of them. It says in verse Seven, and the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. Then look at verse 16. And she said unto them, Get ye to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. So these are pursuers, she calls them. You got these people, these principalities pursuing you when you get saved. 
And these are vigilant princes, principalities and powers. They're vigilant. And Joshua and Israel would be physically fighting men like the king of Jericho and his army. But me and you are spiritually fighting principalities and powers. Ephesians 6. The king of Jericho was watching and ready for the spies. Our adversary is also watching, waiting, and taking everything into account. You're on his watch list. Um, he hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Have you counted the cost? You take on a whole new legion of enemies when you enlist in the Lord's army. Mark 5, 9, that, that devil-possessed man, them demons in him said, my name is Legion, for we are many. You're taking on a legion when you get in the Lord's army. You're no longer simply just fighting flesh and blood, but a much more sinister group. Spiritual wickedness in high places. In this war, you're going to need spiritual help from God. And when you realize the cost of serving God includes fighting an evil spirit world, it begins to change your perspective on things because when you're serving God and your wife goes crazy your work your co-workers torment you and tragedies arise all around you don't fret about it just press on because those are just spiritual grenades from the opposing army led by the God of this world the devil second Corinthians 4 4 the God of this world and he's just throwing grenades at you so maybe it's like you just one thing's happening right after another. You're just walking through a landmine. You, you got these bombs going off. Feels like grenades are getting thrown at you. It's spiritual warfare. Because you got principalities trailing you. These vigilant principalities and powers. The rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. They... Just as Jeric the king of Jericho found out the two spies were coming to search out the country, the moment you got saved, the devil knows that you are liable to start coming and stealing his children. You are liable to start coming in there and making, gaining ground for the Lord and his work. So what's he going to do? He's going to, him and his minions are going to come at you full force. You got these vigilant principalities and powers watching you. So you got to be vigilant. Be sober. Be vigilant. These are violent pursuers. In verse 5, in Joshua 2, 5, it says, And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate when it was dark, that the men went out, whether <clears throat> she said, This is Rahab talking. It says, Whither the men went, I won't not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. You see, they're going to overtake them. Rahab's trying to get them away from the men because she knows they're going to overtake them. Rahab was being wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. She told the men of Jericho to pursue them quickly and overtake them. She was pretending to be on their side. But not only, this shows us that not only are they going to come for them quickly, but if caught, they would overtake them. They would have killed them dead. That's exactly what your adversary wants to do. That's exactly what your adversaries want to do. Quickly, it says. So almost immediately. I remember back when I got saved, almost immediately. I was approached by false teachers from various cults. You see, the devil ordered some spiritual hitmen for my Christian walk to slay me. Quickly. I mean, within a month. And immediately I was pursued. That's the cost of serving God. The devil saw me get saved. The devil saw me get 
right into the Bible. Saw me find out they about the King James Bible almost as soon as I got saved. Get hooked up with the right people and everything. The first year I was saved, I was quickly pursued by people like Oneness Pentecostals. One was an older man, 1 Kings 13, 11. That reminds me of that story. An old prophet coming to a young man. I was 21. So this older man, who was much better versed in the Bible than me, even though he was wrong. You see, just because somebody's wrong and dead wrong on certain doctrines. Remember this, just because they're dead wrong on a certain doctrine. Maybe even a damnable doctrine. That doesn't mean they don't know more Bible than you and therefore could easily deceive you. He was, he knew way more of the Bible than me. Even though I was right about salvation, he was wrong about salvation. And then another oneness Pentecostal approached me at the same time, not at the same instance, but around the same time. And a girl my age who wanted to convert me to the bad doctrine that she had and then date me. So you could see the devil pursued me quickly from different angles. I'd, I'd never been witnessed to before, for one, and I'd never been propositioned for a date before. So you see, he was trying all different angles, pursuing me quickly. But, you know, when, when that guy, he, that one, this Pentecost, uh, he said he was a apostolic oneness Pentecostalism or something like that. And he would get right up in my face and had these crazy looking eyes. Sometimes he'd come in there and his face would be all shrunk in, look like he had been fasting for weeks and weeks and weeks. And he'd ride around on a bike. Sometimes he'd grow his beard out really long. I'd see him preach on the street and everything else, but I knew one, he would he'd try to say, you know, you got to be baptized in Jesus' name only to be saved. And the only verse I knew about baptism at the time was in Matthew 28, being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's the verse I'd pull out and use on him, and it, it always worked. But that was just part of the price you pay. When you enlist in the Lord's army and you begin serving the Lord, you're going to have vigilant princes, principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world pursuing you. These are violent pursuers. So you need to count the cost, realizing the devil is going to be sending his army your way and you have to study. 2 Timothy 2.15, you study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can't spend all your time lollygagging around. You're going to be deceived by a false teacher and in turn start deceiving others. That's what was wrong with the Galatians. They got deceived by a false teacher and started deceiving themselves. He says in Galatians 3, 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn you, learn of you, receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. You see, they had been tricked. They had been bewitched by somebody. And in turn, they were deceiving their self, deceiving each other. A saved person can be deceived. A saved person can... Definitely be saved, but get taught wrong, and then he starts teaching false doctrine. That's why there's people in the Church of Christ that are saved. There's people in all different types of cults that are saved. They got saved, and then they were taught wrong. They got deceived. Therefore, they're deceiving others. So, you're going to have to get in the Word of God, your manual. Your, this is your manual for being in the Lord's army. You got principalities trailing you. That's one of the prices you'll pay. Now, number two, 
the populace's talk of you. Look in Joshua again, Joshua chapter 2, and look at what they were saying about Israel. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 2. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, There came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. So there's talk that they're going to be causing them some trouble. Then look at verse 8, Joshua 2, 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. So you see, there have been a lot of talk about Israel and about the Lord and about what all has been going on. Now look at verse 9. And she said unto them, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. And verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. So, lost people, they, they hear about your God, they hear about your victories. The king of Jericho was told that the spies had come in. See, they're talking about them. Rahab informed them of what was being said in Jericho, how the Lord hath given them the land. She said they had heard of the Red Sea crossing the slaying of Sihon and Og, those giant kings. So you got the populace's talk of you, their expectations of you. You see, Jericho would have had big-time expectations concerning a people that overcome the Egyptians and crossed the Red Sea on foot. They got big expectations for them. In Joshua 2.8, uh, some commentators say that the spies laid with Rahab, like laid with her, you know. Joshua 2, 8, and it says, And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. So since it says before they were laid down, they say that they knew the harlot. But it means before they went to sleep. It's not saying they did things with Rahab the harlot. And they didn't sleep with Rahab because they knew that wouldn't match the conduct of an Israelite that served God. Not to mention they already heard Rahab's expectations of them. You know, she's just got done telling them uh, she knows about their God and about them. Why would they ruin their testimony there? The moment someone finds out you're a Christian, they're going to have as much expectations for you as Jericho had for Israel. This is a price you must pay for naming the name of Christ. So in 2 Timothy 2.19, Paul says, if you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. You know, as a lost man, I would cuss. I would act crazy. I'd lay out of class. I'd speak my mind with no care of who I hurt or losing my good name. A price you pay of being a professional Christian is you have to live it. You can't just, they couldn't have just went into the harlot's house and did with Rahab the harlot what people usually did with Rahab the harlot. You know, the world sets sinless standards on Christians even. When I stick my neck out for the Lord Jesus Christ, the cost of that is that I'm going to be under a microscope 364 days a year, 24 hours a day. And I shouldn't give them occasion to blaspheme like David did in 2 Samuel 12, 14. You got their high expectations of you the moment they find out you're a Christian. Have you counted the cost of living for God in front of your family, your friends, your co-workers? You see, the world has heard just like Jericho had heard the world has heard how God saves sinners and makes them a better man are you trying your hardest to make your state 
match your standing as much as you can. And what that means is when you got saved, your standing in the Lord is sinless perfection because you got the Lord's righteousness on you. But your state is another story. Your state is how you're living at any given moment. That's what you need to do is make your state match your standing as much as you possibly can. And that's, you're never going to get it to match perfectly because your standing is sinless perfection because it's got the Lord's righteousness on it. But there's nothing that says you shouldn't try your hardest to strive to be as holy as you can. Your state will never be perfect. But thank God that your state doesn't affect your standing. Your standing can't be affected by how you're living at any given moment. It always stays sinlessly perfect because it's the righteousness of Jesus. But I want people to see my state as as good as they can possibly see it because of their expectations of me. And they're talking about me. They're talking about you if they find out you're a Christian. You have a responsibility. It's your duty in this army to at least try to live up to the name Christian. You know, the Israel, they needed to try their hardest to live up to an army that serves a God that just had them cross the Red Sea on dry ground. You know, you have a responsibility. You know, they were called Christians first in Antioch because they acted so much like Jesus Christ, Acts eleven twenty six. 26. Do you try to live up to godly biblical standards or do you have a good report of them that are without, 1 Timothy 3, 7? says, having a good report of them that are without. That's one of the qualifications for a bishop. Having a good report of them that are without. Those that are lost. What do the lost people say about you at work? You know, the, the people at Jericho, they were in awe of Israel. What are they saying about you? You know, you got their expectations of you. And they, you got their expectations of your God. Have you counted the cost to serve the one true God? Rahab said the Lord had given them the land. In verse 9, she said, The Lord is the one who dried up the Red Sea. She said, He is God in heaven above and the earth beneath. In verse 11, she's got high expectations for their God. It seems Rahab has been converted here. You see, the world has huge expectations for the God you serve. Have you counted the cost to serve a God like him? Because many aren't like Rahab. They're not going to say if God is all power, you know, they're not going to say that he's God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. They're going to say, you know, if God is all powerful, then why do bad things happen to good people? And ask these kind of questions. Are you prepared to suffer the ridicule and the shame? And count it a joy to suffer shame for his name. Are you going to be prepared to suffer the ridicule and the shame that goes along with preaching the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? The populace is going to say, how could you serve a God that allows murder and rape, sex trafficking, death, pain, sorrow, agony, torture? That's the kind of questions they're going to ask you. They're not all going to be like Rahab the harlot. On one hand, you'll have them judging you for serving a God that demands the killing of women and children in the Old Testament. Then you'll have another part of the people that expects more out of you because of the great God you serve, like Rahab expected for Israel. It's not easy sailing either way. Have you counted the cost that you are now an ambassador for an holy nation and the king of kings, and you're going to have to walk the narrow way in front of this world. They couldn't, the spies couldn't have just went in there and laid down with Rahab the harlot and did with, uh, 
with Rahab what people do with harlots. They had high expectations. Now, the next price that you pay is people rejecting you. It wasn't just the spies with something at stake here. Rahab hid the spies at the cost of possibly losing her life. In verses 3 through 8, she believed in the true God at the cost of possibly being rejected by her family and the citizens of her city there. And you're going to have people rejecting you. That's a price you'll pay. You're going to have people rejecting you because of your past. She was called Rahab the harlot. You know, what if the two spies rejected Rahab because she was an harlot at one time? You know, there are saints today who have rejected a new believer over a lot less. And I read some commentators that teach Rahab was in the wrong for telling a lie to save the spies. And I've I've heard some that say the spies were wrong for saying, for staying at the harlot's house. And she may have been a harlot, but now she's making a living by working with their hands. Look at Joshua 2.6. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, the two spies. She's hiding the two spies out away from the men of Jericho. But she brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order up on the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan and to the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon and Ah, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life is yours if you utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we are coming to the land, that thou shalt bind this scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in, thine ho in the house, the blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. If thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window. And they went and came into the mountain and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned. And the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. So you see, she did the right thing. She hid the spies. She chose whose side she was going to be on, not wicked Jericho and all their false gods, but Israel's side and the true God. But you're going to have, with making that choice, you're going to have people rejecting you because of your past. She was Rahab the harlot, you see. You know, you're going to run into saints that reject you because of, because of your old life. 
that's one of the prices you pay when you get saved with a bad past is you'll, you'll lose that connection with the sinners of the world and then you can't get acceptance from a lot of the saints because of your past and who you used to be. So it could be lonely, but you can count on the fellowship with God Almighty and the genuine, sincere saints as a great reward of staying faithful in all the rejection. You're going to have people rejecting you because of your past. You're going to have people rejecting you because of your present. You see, Rahab chose the true God and chose to bless Israel at the possible cost of being rejected by unbelieving friends and family that she had. She wanted her family saved from God's wrath on Jericho. In verse 13 and 18, you see that where it says, and that you will save my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And then in verse 18, they said, Behold, when me come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. She had a burden for her family, you see. She wanted her family saved from God's wrath on Jericho, but she was going to choose God and the people of God over her own family. You see, they had a free will to reject her God, her new life and the place of safety because the spy said, whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house in 219. You see, it was a, it was a free will choice. Maybe they would come to Rah Rahab's house. Maybe they wouldn't. What if her family rejected how she presently was at the time? What if they thought she was a big fanatic with that scarlet thread hanging out that window? What if they were calling her a Zionist for following Israel? What if they accused her of for being dumb and uneducated, for thinking the wrath of God was really going to fall on the land? You see, following God comes at a cost. Some may have scoffed at the scarlet thread, which pictured the blood of Jesus Christ, obviously. They might have thought she was silly for thinking that the Lord would deliver her from the wrath to come. Maybe some post-tribbers were there and they thought she would have to go through the slaughter of Jericho at least midway to midway through it. You know, a price you pay is getting laughed at. Second Peter 2, 2, you got the, the scoffers. You know, are you ready for the ridicule of being a Bible believer? Have you counted the cost? You know, following the Lord Jesus Christ comes at a cost, but it comes with an even bigger reward. Rahab faced all the risks that came along with turning things over to the one true God, but she got so much in return. Rahab gets her name mentioned in three places of the New Testament. Matthew 1, 5, Hebrews eleven thirty one, James 2, 25. She marries an Israelite and gets into the line of Christ. Matthew 1, 5. She's in the line of Christ. She gets spared because of the scarlet thread, which pictures the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be suffering for the Lord right now. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. But you just wait until you get to the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be a highly decorated Christian soldier for suffering. And you're going to have so much gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, and crowns to throw out the feet of Jesus Christ. You know, anything worth doing is worth sacrificing for and paying a price for. Have you counted the cost to serve God in a present evil world that hates God Almighty? And do you want to run the race like a soldier in the Lord's army? Or do you want to run it like a regular run-of-the-mill Christian that's conformed to the world? Do you want to run the race like someone that knows there are rewards waiting on the other side.